through my own experience of healing from I had multiple chronic and very life-threatening addictions God did for me what I was very incapable of doing for myself and I realized that I had a miracle that was pretty rare and that few people are given as much freedom in a moment as I was given but at that moment I had no will to live I was I I was completely wiped out in my life and had been for some time it had just there was no strength or health left to keep going but God miraculously healed me and at the time I would have thought it was delivering me from my addictions if I were looking at it any different way but because of the torment that I had been in for so many years I saw it as peace I actually have peace and all these other things had happened I had been miraculously healed and delivered but it was the peace that was so stunning that I because I didn't know peace I had never known peace and I was so distracted by the peace that that's the thing that was what I clung to of all the miracles that probably happened there the peace was so amazing and that's what I pursued God on that because nothing else that I had ever tried or had been offered to me as a solution for my raging sick lifestyle had ever produced any kind of peace in my life and for many years I had battled self-hatred severe eating disorders alcoholism I was chronic alcohol I don't think I ever stopped drinking for a day completely for probably eight years drug addiction I was in abusive relationships I was in toxic relationships I was toxic and abusive in relationships I was void of integrity I had no aversion to criminal conduct I drove intoxicated every day I don't even remember how I got places most of the time and I did other things that were very wrong and illegal and I had absolutely I I didn't have very many things that I would draw a line to to keep me getting what I needed I would do what I had to do to get what I needed and with the raging addictions I had it was a constant hunt I was financially very destructive to myself and others and there were many times that I tried hard to change my behavior but I I was always powerless even for a few minutes I seemed to be powerless because my own mind was so foreign it was not connected to me in some way it it yelled and it condemned and it it didn't seem it was not friendly to me so there was really no way for me to get up over anything that was going on because I had no control of my own mind and when I eventually learned what peace was after Jesus rescued me I started to understand at some point not right away because the basking in that freedom was incredible I'd never had that experience but at some point it became a something I was aware of that I had wounds I had some deep hidden wounds that I wasn't quite sure what to do with because people could really hurt my feelings quickly things could be said that made me just completely leave somewhere and now I'm sober I'm completely sober I'm not on anything where before that was my solution and getting prayed over did nothing to heal these wounds so I was in a Pentecostal church that's where I had been healed there's plenty of prayer lines but there was no result for this type of thing so when you have deep pain from neglect or abuse 
You can't just say, be healed in the name of Jesus, and it's healed right there. That is very rare. There's more to be done to close that door to the devil. And God brought people into my life who understood that and started that healing process for me. So it was two years after I was saved, the first group taught me about strongholds, soul ties, mostly those two things. And it was brought a significant difference to my life to have those broken. The second layer was, um, it was more the, the deep healing of the emotional wounds, which come from early years and your perception of them. So I had to go through significant inner healing and then deliverance at that point, which was a whole different thing. And then years later, I went to learn a certain type of prayer ministry because I was very drawn to this because of the impact it had on my life. And, and I learned about inner vows and bitter root judgments. And that ended up being a significant part of what kept me locked up. And um, I couldn't really touch my feelings or my even my identity at times. Passionately loved Jesus, but it was amazing how little connection I had to my own self. So when they started breaking these vows and judgments, I about had a heart attack because I had all this trauma that started coming up. And so I'm pretty careful with that process. But through all of those things, I realized the amount of healing a person can get beyond getting sober that is stunning. It is absolutely stunning how much healing you can get through these different um, biblical God gives us ways that we can get freedom from so many of these wounds. What I had to do was surrender all the pain that was buried in me to God. And then I had to be taught how to trust God with those areas. And it was very hard for me to trust God. I seemed to have a very, real close kinship with Jesus. I didn't have any issues with him, but I had some real fear of God. And I'm assuming that was connected to a lot of the wounds and things I'd been told about God. I had to learn how to feel my feelings, which was foreign to me because I had them all so packed away. I couldn't even touch them. And so it was pretty frightening to realize I had so many when I always tell people I don't have any feelings. I really preferred it that way, especially all of the anger. That was a little surprising, but I had to trust God with them so that he could heal me of what was causing this. And that was a real process. In fact, I would say I'm still in that process. Change does not happen overnight. It's ongoing. You have to stay committed to it. You have to be very courageous. You have to be transparent. You have to, you have to really be wanting that level of freedom. But every single day since I started, it has been worth it. And I think the process is good because it's taught me so many things about how to identify things in other people and how to help them walk through. I can kind of look at people's faces and see what's happening because of my own process. Emotional trauma lies at the heart of many types of addictions. And this is what you don't always hear. You will hear that people have trauma. You will hear that they have mental health. You will hear those things, but not so clearly stated that the trauma is driving the addictive behavior in many cases, not all, but in many. And since the 1970s, treatment professionals have understood that the role of trauma in the development of substance use disorders and relapsing is significant. They know this. A study published in Alcoholism Clinical and Experimental Research confirmed what many in the treatment field have long watched, a history of childhood neglect or sexual, physical, or emotional abuse is common among people who are undergoing treatment for alcohol alcoholism and may be a factor in the development of alcohol use disorders. Abuse 
was also linked to a higher risk of anxiety disorders, depression, suicide. And in contrast, the general population has physical abuse rates of 8.4%. The rate for alcoholics has been reported at 24% for men, 33% for women, underreported, most likely. The rate of sexual abuse in the general population is around 6%, while the rate for alcoholics has been reported at 12% for men and 49% for women. 49% for women. And this study adds to a large amount of research already linking addiction with trauma. Studies show that children with three or more trauma exposure factors are 19 times more likely to increase their use of drugs or alcohol and trauma has been associated not only with drug addiction, but also overeating, which is a very serious addiction, compulsive sexual behavior, a very serious addiction, and other types of addictions. The Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, your ACE score, which you can Google and find out that information, the ACE is uh, used to determine many things in this field which is based on data from over 17,000 Kaiser patients, found correlations between severe childhood stress, which is abuse, neglect, loss of a parent, domestic violence, or having an addicted or mentally ill parent with various types of addictions. They found that a child with four or more adverse childhood experiences is five times more likely to become an alcoholic and 60% more likely to become obese and a boy with four or more of these experiences is 46 times more likely to become an injection drug user than other children. The researchers found that these effects of trauma are cumulative and that one of the most destructive forms of chronic recurrent humiliation in the emotional abuse form, that is one of the most destructive chronic recurrent humiliation, name calling and ridiculing is one of the most destructive traumas to a child. I was, um, I worked in the treatment field for 20 years and I, at times, I, I really went all over the state, but I talked with a group of men and there was about probably 55 men in the group. And I brought up to them that I had been studying my, what I love doing most is prayer ministry and breaking off these things. And I said I was in the process of studying about how many people who are chronic and looping in treatments and other facilities because they just can't get free they've tried everything they just don't know why they can't break out how many of them had an early sexual violation in their life like some kind of incestuous thing that happened an uncle somebody in the family older brother older any it doesn't matter which sex it was because both males and females will abuse but having that factor was a huge factor in many people that cannot get free. It was a big piece of the ones who just don't know how to stop the cycle. So I was talking about that and saying, I knew the impact of that area on my own life and how much damage it did to me. And I said, I'm gonna continue to learn more about that because I believe that if you break ties with this person and then you do the forgiveness work and then you break the, down the strongholds, it's just a real process of that. But if you actually do that, if you are a born again Christian, not if you're not, that God will separate you from that person. Otherwise, you are tethered to them in the spirit realm and you are 
carrying so much of what was passed to you and how much freedom you can get by having someone do that prayer work with you to separate you from those who have sexually abused you or violated you in some way and this does not mean intercourse even it could be touching is such a violation to many young people they know that they have been violated so it doesn't have to be an actual sexual act but they can be just as damaged by someone who isolates them takes advantage of liberties in that way to to get what people teach kids is bad touch it is very traumatic for a child makes them very afraid and it carries into their adult life it, they become very skewed as far as what is normal and so at the time I'm bringing this up with the men and I'm just sharing this with them candidly and I just was talking about how much I was reading that showed this and so someone said to them if anyone wants to um, have prayer with Wendy before she goes and address this basically we're giving you the privacy to do that you can sign up for time with her within 10 minutes 23 of those men had put their name on a list and many of them said to me, I've never said a word to anyone about this because I don't want to for one. I don't know how to fix it for two. Nobody cared when I was little or at whatever age. No one seemed to know what to do about it. And here they are trapped in this lifestyle and nobody had ever brought it up as being something that could be pivotal in their recovery and so um they just appreciated having the privacy and the confidentiality to address it knowing it wasn't going to be uh, made a bigger thing for them because they're terrified of people finding out they're so shamed of their own identity based on a choice someone else made and i was shocked like half of the group of men actually and i'm sure there was more actually came forward privately to tell me that that's me and i don't know what to do about it so i know that it is a big group of people and highly underreported and trauma is subjective meaning what matters most is what the individual believes and their natural sensitivity to stress, not whether a family member, a therapist, or another person thinks it's traumatic. It is what does that person feel about it. If it was traumatic to them, it is trauma. Doesn't matter how anyone else identifies it. They can say, well, I didn't have sex with them. I just this or this. That is ridiculous. It is not up to anyone else to determine the trauma. Trauma can stem from abuse or neglect as well as other painful or frightening experiences. Car accidents, bullying is a major one. Um, crimes in the school, if you watch fights or if you watch um, violence in the school, I still remember those. I still remember them and how traumatic they were to, to watch fights in the school. Sudden life change or near-death experience, whether it was firsthand or you witnessed it and others, you know, saw a car accident that happened where things were terrible. It can also result from growing up in an alcoholic or addicted home or any other environment where children are taught to bury their feelings. And this will happen with certain ethnic groups. You're taught to bury your feelings. The Scandinavians are good at this. Um, Others are too where you just are taught do not display your emotions. And as a result of the trauma, the individual feels intense fear or helplessness, which can lead to serious long-term struggles with depression, anxiety, addictive and impulsive behaviors. And without your consent, trauma changes you and often into a person you would rather not become. That's a normal part of what happens after trauma. It changes you and you don't like the changes. However, you always have the opportunity to change again. 
And I wouldn't say change back because you can change better. And from deep inside your brain to your interaction with the outer world, you have such great healing capacity waiting for you, but you have to choose to take that path. Trauma is especially damaging when it happens to children because children do not have a frame of reference to put trauma experiences into. They have no context. They don't have any way to make sense of them. Their primary support is their family and family is often the cause of the trauma. So children feel that their family is right and they are the bad part of the family in cases of abuse or neglect. So children grow up feeling responsible for parents' divorce, for parents' addictions, for parents' domestic issues. Children take on the blame for these things that adults do. And as a result, children adapt to getting their normal emotional needs met in very unhealthy ways because it isn't safe to do it. They don't have any options that are provided in a healthy way. And this can easily develop to the trauma survivor learning to self-medicate. And rather than thinking about or reliving the event, they can choose drugs, alcohol, other substances or behaviors to numb feelings of fear, powerlessness, depression, to cope with these tormenting memories. One of the worst things that ever happened to me in my course of drug addiction was working with someone who had just gotten out of treatment. And I was by no means ever willing to go to treatment, but I asked this person out of curiosity, what were you addicted to? And they said, nothing illegal. And I thought, what? Why how would you go to treatment then? And they said, I used over-the-counter drugs. I did, I mixed things. I took what I could buy in a drugstore and I mixed them. And I said, like what? And they told me, which ended up being a terrible thing for me to learn, but I intentionally sought that information out. It does not have to be illegal. It does not have to be seen as wrong. There are many things that you can buy over the counter that are being abused and have the effect almost greater at times than the illegal substances you can buy. And I will say the smoke shops now are full of things that are actually more toxic and produce more serious behavior than some of the things that you have to buy on the street. Drugs allow people to disconnect from their feelings, but it also lessens guilt and rage so they feel like they're actually safer in community by taking something. They aren't going to hurt somebody if they're on something. It increases feelings of relaxation or control, reduces chronic anxiety, and oftentimes suicidal thinking. So people see it as a benefit. It was like that with me when I first started drinking. It's like, oh, finally, I can actually live a normal life. And depending on the drug of abuse, patients may seek to numb painful emotions to feel actually alive. So they can't get there in normal life because they're having to suppress everything, but drugs or alcohol or whatever the addiction helps them have life. Patients also report a feeling of unconditional acceptance among other drug users and Many often choose this group over their family of origin because the acceptance is so needed and so priceless. They hang out with their using friends because of the camaraderie. Whatever purpose drug use serves for the trauma survivor, it starts as one problem, which is unresolved trauma, and then it becomes very complicated by a second serious problem, substance abuse or other high risk behaviors. So until the coping mechanism itself becomes so disruptive that intervention is needed, jail, um, just even calls to the police that result in intervention, family intervention, something goes terribly wrong, a divorce, losing your children, something disruptive happens. Often this group is unaware that they use an addiction to cope with the symptoms of trauma. They may have little memory of the traumatic experiences and later in life they start noticing the, all these destructive patterns that they are in 
with relationships, even their professional life, they can't seem to resolve them. And I know that my jobs, when I was a chronic addict, I, I took jobs where I was not isolated to a building where I had to be out with like clients where we could meet in a bar. I was in the bar all the time and I dressed to sell. And so I worked my entire life and my career at the time around my need for continuous alcohol. Often people get stuck in a cycle of chronic relapse or they stop using drugs by force only to self-soothe with an eating disorder, a sex addiction, or self-harm, cutting some other problem, because the underlying problem, the trauma, remains unaddressed. And this needs to be recognized and help needs to be sought for this very specific area. Many often report to me that inside programs, they feel too vulnerable to go there. They worry about having a breakdown, because there's so many people around them and they're contained in this space. They don't want to have all these emotions raw. They don't want to be susceptible to people triggering them if their emotions are on their sleeve. They also worry about the fact that they know someone is taking notes of everything they're saying and they know that their courts at times will subpoena notes. They don't want those things being um, translated into a, some other case that comes up against them. They don't want to be seen as weak when they can't get control of their emotions in this very public, intimate setting. And this healing needs a setting that's ideal for a person to feel total safety in processing, but that's generally not going to come in a large group all clustered together inside of a building. And while each trauma is unique to the individual who experienced the event, there are some very common themes. One, the person did not anticipate the event. Two, the person felt very unprepared for that experience. Three, the first person, the person felt powerless to prevent the situation. And four, the situation was not that person's fault. There is not a single trauma that can be named as worse for addiction because everyone is prone to experience trauma and they're likely to react in a unique way, depending on many things, personality, value system, former trauma, it just depends, many, there are many variables. There is a way to resolve past traumas in a healthy way. God made us and God can heal us. That's the one certain way that is available and sometimes those who experience trauma get stuck in a loop. They're unable to move past or to even process what has happened. And this leads to what is called or known as severe mental health disorders of various kinds, most commonly PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. This is a psychological fight or flight response that can occur in people who experience trauma. And this is very personal to me because I feel that I have had PTSD probably the most severe in the last few years to the point that my health was severely impacted and I'm continuing to work through that and expecting healing, but it's kept me from being able to step back and look at or be even be around a lot of people. So I've had to really narrow my life down to a small life in comparison so that I can continue to work on healing. Not the only time I've had PTSD, this was different. I was sober um, and certainly had a lot of tools and skills, but somehow I ended up powerless in it. And so I really am sensitive to this area and I feel a lot of compassion for people because if it could happen to me, who was 20 years and working in a treatment center, it could happen to a lot of people. There are many types of trauma um, that, but the most common being physical assault, sexual assault, domestic violence, emotional or verbal abuse, parental neglect, 
bullying or harassment, accidents like car crashes or fire, natural disasters or terminal illness. And while many physical wounds may heal, emotional scars can leave the lives of those affected by trauma stopped in their tracks. Trauma can change a person's perspective and make it difficult to cope with life after it occurs. While no one plans to become dependent on drugs or alcohol, many people start abusing them to cope with that trauma because it so impacts every area of their life. Trauma can take numerous forms and affect each individual in a different way, which is what makes it hard to quantify or to make a program about trauma because it's so individualized. What's traumatizing to one person may not even phase another person, even in the same family unit. What causes long-term anxiety or emotionally debilitating reactions for one person may have a very short-lived effect on another. The crucial factor isn't what the event was, it was how the person perceived and was able to cope with that event. And if you're in a weakened season of your life and something happens, the effect of it at that time will be very different than if you had had this happen at a different time of your life when you were better able to handle it. Some of the most commonly addressed traumas and how they contribute to addiction are sexual abuse. And in many cases, sexual assault or rape is perpetuated by someone whom the victim knows and trusts a family member, a family friend, or an acquaintance. Very often, it's someone close to the family. And because of that, sexual trauma issues such a feeling of betrayal. It is such a harsh betrayal to safety and safe people. And because rape and sexual abuse are so traumatic, self-medication often appears to be a preferable solution rather than seeking help because you often see the community around this, because it involves someone close in the, com the community, they all work to conceal the abuse. The family image is more important than the child's identity being hijacked and destroyed by a heinous crime against them. And again, intercourse is not needed. This can be a complete violation of boundaries, um, just intimate contact that just completely robs this child of their safety. They know it's wrong and they have lost all sense of safety and trust. Another is emotional and or physical childhood abuse. It shouldn't hurt to be a child, but it often does hurt to be a child. And the effects of physical and emotional childhood abuse and neglect extend far beyond the years of childhood. What has happened to a child most child, they say personalities are formed by the age of four, so they don't have a lot of memory before that, but they have a very, their personality is almost set by then. So it's happening around what's all going on those early years, and then you have to work through it the rest of your life. In many cases, not all, but many. Grief is another, when a loved one passes away or suffers a severe illness or injury, grieving can take such a huge toll on the mental and emotional state of the individual. And people deal with grief in various ways, but it's incredibly complex, especially when the person was a close friend or a family member. Crimes or accidents are another, witnessing or being a victim of a wreck or a crime such as robbery or assault leaves more than just physical scars. Trauma from such events alter the way people function in their daily life. For example, if a person was attacked in a grocery store parking lot, they may experience increased heart rate or panic when running errands, walking in a parking lot, or making a grocery list even. I've had, um, I had a physical assault, and I will say that to this day, I'm always watching to see if a car is not leaving from following me. I'm still very, I pay close attention to things like that. And if I think that this person has followed me too long, I will turn off. I will, I will not go home. I will make other um, diversions in my route to simply throw this thing off because I'm I've not lost that yet. 
Natural disasters are another. A single catastrophic incident such as an earthquake can be life-changing and super traumatic. An individual may suffer from re-experiencing that trauma through dreams, hallucinations, flashbacks. They replay that scenario over and over again, thinking how they could have or should have reacted differently to come out stronger. A trauma survivor lies in a never-ending state of shame, pain, and guilt, continually re-experiencing this horrifying event or situation. For me personally, the loss of a pet is excruciating. I cannot, I don't know how to, I don't know how to explain that because it, but it just is that way that losing a pet at times I've gone into shock. I am so devastated by that, that it's, it's the most crippling thing that has happened to me as a Christian at times. I am really shaken by the loss of people but the pets it has something in me that says i failed them or i don't know but i've that's another area i'm always working on fear drives all post-trauma related behaviors healing focuses on resolving the fear according to michelle rosenthal Today, it's much easier to see how trauma and addiction go hand in hand due to the advances in neuroscience that we now know. The amygdala, which is the brain's threat detection center, becomes, can become overactive, engaging in a constant program of looking for, seeing, and assessing the threat. And this will cause you to feel intensely anxious, vulnerable, and fearful when it's doing that. So if it's always doing that, you're always feeling anxious, vulnerable, and fearful. The hippocampus, your brain's center for processing memories, can become underactive rather than consolidating and then placing memories in the outer layer of the brain for long-term storage. Memories get hung up in a present day loop. And the result is you will experience and re-experience intrusive, disturbing, and uncomfortable recollections. The cortex, which is our brain center for executive control, becomes interrupted by survival-oriented instincts from deep inside of our inner brain. And these instincts overrule logical thinking, they diminish cognitive processing, and they decrease your ability to inhibit behavior. And even when you try to refrain from addictive behavior, you will experience an unstoppable urge to engage in it, resulting from trauma. Addictions often help reduce the sensation of, that overwhelm the post-trauma changes that are created. And when addictions are implemented as an attempt to manage what becomes unmanageable after trauma, they become a negative example of a very positive survival instinct. The key is to recognize this and learn how to turn it around into a positive thing. So most bad behavior begins with a good intention, writes Ms. Rosenthal. You didn't wake up one day and decide to become an addict or a criminal. Most likely, you have trauma in your history and you woke up with a conscious or unconscious desire for what all trauma survivors want, safety and control. The good intention behind your addictive behavior has its roots in positive outcomes, including relaxation from hypervigilance to fear, relief from tormenting memories, and restoration from the inability to choose your behavior. You can look at your addictive behavior and feel embarrassed, ashamed, frustrated, or other negative emotions because the community is very hard on you. Or you can observe your addiction for the good intention that lied beneath it when it started, the desire to make yourself feel better or give you a possibility of surviving your day Acknowledging this allows you to begin understanding that while the addiction behavior is very less than desirable, it makes sense, especially if the addiction is driven by one or more of these seven desires. One, to stay safe. After trauma, your own mind can feel like a danger zone, which makes being out of it feel safer than being in it. Another is to escape memories. Unwanted and unresolved memories have a way of popping up incessantly after trauma and addictions offer the mind a different area of a reduced capacity for focus that seems to suppress reminiscing. 
Another is to soothe pain. Substances or the adrenaline rush of self-destructive behaviors change your body chemistry, releasing endorphins and other mood enhancers that reduce discomfort. Another is being in control. Sometimes engaging in addictive behaviors can lead you to feel strong, resilient, and courageous, an experience that is tremendously alluring when trauma from the past intrudes into your present. Another is to create a world you can tolerate. The intense feelings brought on by fear, memories, and anxiety can make many moments overwhelming. And the release of tension brought on by addiction helps facilitate a much more manageable experience. Another is to treat yourself the way you feel you deserve. Trauma can leave you feeling less than, worthless, hopeless, and damaged. And the more self-destructive you behave, the more it makes you feel that way. While this is false, it can help reduce feelings of this sort by using addiction to mask these symptoms. It also helps you redefine who you are. Trauma changes your identity, identity all the way down to the core of your beliefs and self-definition. And it can seem as if no one understands you. And engaging in addictions can help create a sense of community by connecting you to others who feel, see, and think, and behave just as you do. Or addictions can help you revise your self-perception by allowing you to engage in and act out behaviors that allow you to feel stronger, more courageous, capable, and having less trauma. People who suffered a childhood trauma experience have a wide range of side effects, both psychological and behavioral. And sometimes your mind can try to cope with trauma by covering it up, but the signs will still come out. Some of the symptoms you can experience as a result of a traumatic experience include dramatic mood shifts, erratic behavior, excessive or inappropriate displays of emotion, ongoing fear, nervousness, or anxiety, prolonged agitation or irritability, lack of confidence or timidity, eating disorders, avoiding things that remind you of your traumatic experience, continually reliving the event, problems with how you relate with others in your professional life, and romantic and social relationship issues. And those who sustain a traumatic experience in their childhood are also at an extremely high risk of developing an addiction to drugs or alcohol. The wounded soul requiring inner healing will usually fall into five central wound areas. One, rejection, which is feeling a deep loss and judgment. Two, injustice is a feeling that something has been taken from you. Three, abandonment is a feeling of isolation and loneliness. Four, betrayal, which is you were trust was stolen and you were disregarded. And humiliation, which is a feeling of total shame. And all of the kinds of healing, of all the kinds of healing, inner healing touches us in our deepest suffering, that of the heart, the mind, and the inner core of our being. And when we have been deeply wounded through past ex experiences, we carry the memories and the feelings associated with those experiences. And a way that that plays out is, I had a many years out in the world in clubs, rock and roll music, a lot, a lot of things happened during this time. And I was not sober at any point, but I can go into a public place now, like a store or somewhere, somewhere public, and a song will play and immediately pull me into the emotions that were going on at that time. I will instantly start feeling the same things because that song connected me to my trauma. And these memories damage the emotions, they cripple and bind us in our personal and emotional and spiritual lives. And unless God heals us in these areas of brokenness, we will not live and grow into the people that he created us to be. We will live as prisoners trapped in bondage of deep wounds 
And inner healing is God's way of freeing and restoring us from our brokenness and the deepest wounds of our heart. And some of the deepest wounds that I have had healed actually are the strengths in what I do now. They actually make my life far more, I have far more capacity to bring hope to people as a result of those things. Inner healing is indicated whenever we become aware that we are held down in the way, in, by, in any way, by hurts of the past. We, when we are deeply affected, not only by what we do, our own sins and mistakes, but by what happens to us through the sins of others and the evil in the world, which is original sin, our deepest need is for love, and if we are denied love as infants or children or anywhere else, it may affect our lives at a later date and rob us of peace, our inability to love going forward, and our trust for people and God. They are greatly affected. We have to look at when did these problems start, who was involved, how did it impact your image of God, it's very helpful to find out how a person perceives God as you move forward. If the person has experienced severe trauma, they may not be able to actually remember the events in the timeline. The memories could come out in bits and pieces, very disjointed. It can be very difficult for people to share experiences that have caused deep pain and shame. Some will be in denial. They just don't want to believe it's true. What will happen to me if I have to accept that that happened? Emotional honesty is a first step to healing and what sets inner healing ministry apart from other healing, such as physical or generational healing. It is very important, I believe, that people are given privacy in these times to acknowledge what really happened. Most people want to hide their wounds they don't understand their wounds can be healed. The pain shows where the injury is, so you always have to look where the pain is. It directs us to the memory that actually needs healing. A prayer minister must demonstrate tremendous patience in this area of listening when the person is trying to reveal what they are needing healing for. It may not even be accurately sent, but you have to learn to pick up and listen to God at the same time. And you ask the Holy Spirit to bring light to whatever is being shared so that you can actually form what's needing healing. Everyone has some good memories, but a person in chronic emotional pain does not generally remember the good memories. They've been wiped out. The Holy Spirit often releases these positive loving memories because they are strengthening and healing, but they tend to be blocked until the Holy Spirit is able to do that. Inner healing can be blocked by many obstacles. Some include unforgiveness, which is either the need to forgive others or to be forgiven for one's own sin, disappointments, failures, lost dreams, or hopes are another, a distorted belief system about oneself, meaning you believe the lies people have told you about yourself, over the truth about yourself, as God says, so you believe people over God. Guilt and shame, guilt can become a God. Given emotion, when we've sinned, we tend to place God in the same bucket, therefore God is the same as the picture of guilt. Shame, on the other hand, is another very large enemy, which can make us feel like we wish we'd never been born. Guilt says, I made a mistake. Shame says, I am a mistake. Another is demonic interference, which will almost always block healing. So we have to do prayers in advance to secure the area for the lack of inner. We don't want interference from the enemy. Another is inner judgments. This is what I said was a major piece of the latest healing. I don't find hardly anyone that deals with this. It's the negative words uttered against us when through our life, but also the ones that we say against ourselves. Like, you're stupid, becomes I'm stupid, 
these kinds of judgments have a tremendous impact on a person. Um, extreme emotions with anger or fear indicate the person's emotions have been damaged or too little emotion. Apathy. Apathetic people do not know how they should feel in any given situation because they're denying their emotions. And I feel I was that way. When we pray, God's love and healing power will transform painful memories and free us from emotional and spiritual bondage. The Holy Spirit never erases the memory, but he will retell it. He will rescript it, reframe it with truth to remove the crippling effect that it's having on you. Deliverance prayer, binding prayer, cutting free prayer are all prayers of authority. They can be necessary. Sometimes it's just breaking agreements with the enemy on something. Always follow the Holy Spirit, asking him to reveal any blocks to healing that need to be prayed through. Inner healing is usually not instantaneous. <coughs> it requires time as God removes layers of woundedness in our complex emotional framework. We see that with, we can't, you do a bunch of work and people get so exhausted, you just have to stop, seal it off, and just leave it until another time. God's love is central to the restoration and healing of damaged emotions. People who need inner healing often suffer from a love deficiency. All of our emotional needs, of them all, love is the most critical that people need. It's the most important and a love deficiency results when a person has not received sufficient love in their life. The capacity to trust is second in importance to love and arises out of feeling loved and secured. So most people who need inner healing have trust issues and their lack of trust inhibits their relationships with people and with God. Healing of damaged emotions helps them reunite to others in their personal relationships and to God. Francis McNutt described inner healing this way. Jesus, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, takes the memories of our past and heals them from the effects of those emotional wounds that still remain and affect our daily lives. He can fill with his love all those places in us that have so long been empty he can give us the grace to forgive past hurts and resentments. We can ask Jesus Christ to go back to the time when the hurt occurred and free us from the effects of that wound that still remain in the present. This involves two things, bringing to light the things that have hurt us and then praying to the Lord to free us from the binding effects of our hurtful past. Inner healing is a ministry of Jesus, which is healing the brokenhearted and setting the captives free. And that is the absolute purpose of why Tatiana and I stepped out of organized ministry into a private, very secluded, small ministry is because we want to focus completely on setting people free through the power of the Holy Spirit. That is our one and only goal. We also respond to crisis, but it's in an attempt to bring them closer to God. I do want to make it clear that I am pro-therapy, pro-medication when needed, pro-doctors, pro-treatment, pro-psych wards, pro-jail. I don't want anyone seeking this type of help in such a critical area from just anyone. There are so many just anyone's out there that we get the reports of the damage done by certain philosophies or modalities. It's incredible what can happen out in this field. If this is something that you're seeking, take great care in who you choose because you can be so damaged by letting the wrong person into these delicate areas. They often cause reports to come up that are shocking to everyone and and at times later the person will say i don't even know where that came from i know it's not true now 
you don't want to go there. You don't want to be vulnerable in cases where this can happen. Decisions to find this help must be made very carefully and you should seek counsel from others in this type of work to know that this person is respected and proven safe. And I realize that many people charge for this kind of ministry. Be careful of that also because no one, I, I just struggle personally with that. God has been very clear with us that we cannot charge for what work he's doing. So we have definitely surrendered any gain that we could for that work because God has demanded it from us. He's the one doing the work. We should not make money from that. That's us personally. Isaiah 61, 1 through 4 says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. They shall build up ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. That is something God offers. I don't care what kind of skill a human being may have, how brilliant they are. They cannot do what God can do in one touch, in one moment. Elizabeth Elliot's book, Keep a Quiet Heart, she quotes, Why is God doing this to me? When I am tempted to ask that question, it loses its power. When I remember that this Lord, into whose strong hands I long ago committed my life, is engineering a universe of unimaginable proportions and complexity, yet he makes note of the smallest seed and the tiniest sparrow. He is not too busy to keep records of even my falling hair. Yet in our darkness, we suppose that he has overlooked us. He hasn't. In the comments of this message, I will place some resources, some prayers that you can use to break some of these things yourself. I will put, I will put some resources for you to process through some of this area yourself, but I do strongly urge you to not do this in isolation, that you have accountability, that you have spiritual mentors, that you have someone to help you with your thoughts because our thoughts lie to us. We are not a good assessor of our own thoughts or our own feelings. So please have someone with you when you do this. And I again stress to take this very seriously, not to do this casually or carelessly because you're engaging the spirit realm and you want to be very careful and you want to submit completely to God before you ever do that. Do not just do this without being completely hidden in Christ because you have no defense against anything of darkness if you are not. So if you are not born again, and a follower of Jesus Christ, don't even step into this. If you want to be born again and a follower of Jesus and you don't know how to do that, absolutely reach out to us. We also would love to do prayer ministry with you, but we recognize that we cannot take care of everyone. So we're going to give you a lot of resources as well. So I will place those in the comments. And you're always free to reach out to us for any comments, confusion. We will do our best to answer any of that. Precious Lord, you are the only one that can heal a broken heart. There is absolutely no person that can do that in the world. 
and people are always trying to find a new person to heal their broken heart and there's no possible way we ask for miracles and everyone who hears this that they would be willing to be transparent and humble with you and another so that they can be set free so that they can be set free to follow you and to bless those around them with the same healing that they were given i ask that you explode in our communities in hope and with we ask that you touch so many people that they would just that the word would be shouted from rooftop streets byways highways that Jesus Christ is the healer he makes no he has no preferences he died to heal all of us so i ask that you do that that you bring healing to so many that people will not settle to be stunted and crippled and broken and constantly stuck in destructive patterns, constantly relapsing. I pray for a miracle, God, that they would hear this and that they would take hope and that they would know that you are the solution and let them take courage and allow you into the deepest parts of their heart. You are the healer. We love you, Jesus. We ask you to continue to help us to grow and represent you better in a much greater way. We ask for more laborers in the field. I ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.